Chua. I have known Dr. Chua since she was a resident at SIU Medicine and have had the honor of watching her blossom and grow into the phenomenal infectious diseases clinician she is today. Dr. Chua is an infectious diseases faculty at SIU School of Medicine, and she also is in a leadership role as the physician champion for our infectious diseases division, where she has made a lot of positive change and moved our uh, clinic in the right direction. Dr. Chua is going to be talking about human papillomavirus today. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Chua. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, I hope that it's showing up. Um, and you can hear me well, yes. Okay, yes, all right, perfect. I'll start then. Um, it's, it's a bit of a shorter topic, um, HPV, um, but, um, you know, we'll try to go through, um, you know, the, the important things, the highlights here. So, again, thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Prakash. Um, you know, I've, I've learned only from the best. Um, so today we'll talk about um, human papilloma virus. Um, and these are some of the things that we'll go through. So some just definitions on virology, epidemiology, the clinical manifestations, diagnosis, therapy, and prevention. So the human uh, papillomavirus or HPV belongs, um, you know, in the papillomavirus genus of the papillomaviridae family. Um, on the right, you'll see that figure um, of the uh, HPV virion. So it's a small non-enveloped uh, virus that has an icosahedral capsid um, with capsomeres that enclose a double-stranded circular DNA. Um, it's widespread um, in the world um, and throughout the population. Um, and they produce um, epithelial tumors of the skin and mucous membranes and have been closely associated with genital tract malignancies. Um, the, from, from Mandel, um, you know, they'll say that there are more than 180 serotypes that have been identified. Um, most recently, now they say that there are more than 200 uh, distinct types that have been identified. Most of um, HPV types really infect the cutaneous um, epithelium and can cause common skin warts. Um, 40 of the uh, 200 types infect the mucosal epithelium. Um, and these are the ones that um, are associated with uh, genital um, uh, cervical or genital malignancies like cervical cancer. Um, so for your HPV um, types, there are those that, again, you know, affect the mucosal or genital um, um, areas and those that affect the cutaneous or non-mucosal sites. For those that um, affect the mucosal or um, the genital sites, um, these are the HPV types that are high risk. Um, on your left. So you have the high risk HPV types 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58, and there are some others too. Um, these are the ones that cause your high or low grade um, lesions of the genital tract, um, and that can cause cervical, anal, penile, um, vaginal, vulvar, and oropharyngeal cancers too. Um, there are some low risk HPV types. So these are your types six and 11, and that can cause uh, more your um, benign uh, lesions, anogenital warts, um, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. And then the, the rest of the, um, you know, the 200 minus 40 um, types, uh, you know, affect your non-mucosal or cutaneous sites and can cause, um, you know, common warts, plantar warts, palmar warts, and other skin warts. Um, of the 90% um, of the cases of an anogenital warts are caused by your low-risk HPV types, 6 or 11, um, and then the high risk HPV types that we've talked about are detected in 
of cervical precancers. Type 16 is the one that really causes a lot of them. Um, approximately 50% of cervical cancers worldwide. Um, and then if you take into account type 18 together, you know, with 16, they account for 66% of cervical cancers. The additional five high risk types, so 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, are then responsible for the next, for another 15% of the cervical cancers and 11% of all HPV associated cancers. Now, it's important to note that while infection of a high risk HPV type is considered necessary, um, is is, is considered necessary for the development of cervical cancer, but by itself is not sufficient to cause cancer because there are, of course, other kinds of cervical cancers that may not really be from an oncogenic virus such as, um, such as um, HPV. And so here in this figure here, um, you know, we see um, how really the pathogenesis of how HPV can cause dysplasia and then cervical cancer if there is persistence um, of infection. So really, it all starts, um, you know, with the HPV making its way down to the basal epithelium. Um, and when it makes its way down to the basal epithelium, they replicate um, in the epithelial cells. What's important to note here is that actually 90% um, of um, you know, infections actually heal within the two years. So a majority of HPV infections are fairly transient and you really need to have more the persistent infection to really develop um, you know, the complications or the severe, um, you know, the, the sequela from um, HPV um, infection. So um, again, it starts at the basal epithelium. Um, most of the infection will heal within two years. 90% of that will heal within two years or resolve in two years. Um, and that although infection is high, um, you know, again, they resolve spontaneously within a year or two. If there is persistent infection, um, then that's your uh, most important risk factor for the development of cervical cancer because then your HPV DNA is integrated into the tumor, um, into the tumor cell DNA, and then that can cause cancer, um, you know, dysplasia, then cancer down the road. In addition to cervical cancers, though, high-risk HPV infection is associated with other kinds um, of anogenital cancer, such as cancer of the vulva, vagina, penis, and anus. And it can also cause um, you know, some types of oropharyngeal cancer. So this is a figure uh, from the CDC. Um, which, you know, kind of gives you a very good visual of how cervical cancer, you know, what, when we think about HPV, we think about oh, cervical cancer, but cervical cancer really is just the tip of the iceberg. There are other things that HPV, um, you know, can cause. There are cervical precancers um, that can cause problems during pregnancy and other cancers, um, you know, anogenital and oropharyngeal um, that HPV can cause. Um, and again, you know, just another visual of the different types of cancer that HPV, um, the HPV virus or, the, or HPV infections can cause. So again, your anogenital cancers, aside from cervical cancer, um, oropharyngeal cancer. Um, and in addition, um, you know, to the cervical cancer, which um, you know, ninety-one percent of those are caused by HPV. Um, you know, ninety-one percent of anal cancers are caused by HPV. Sixty-nine percent of vulvar cancers. Seventy-five percent of vaginal cancers. Sixty-three of penile cancers, and seventy percent of oropharyngeal cancers. Now. Um, you know, HPV is, is, again, like we talked about earlier, it's very widespread. It's extremely common throughout the world. Um, and for human papillomavirus, obviously, as the name suggests, humans are the only really natural reservoir for HPV. Um, most um, sexually active adults will have an HPV infection at some point during their lives. 
But again, majority of them, you know, will be asymptomatic or will never have known that they actually had HPV. And again, you know, that 90% of those who have an HPV infection will resolve, um, you know, spontaneously or will have healed in the, in the next one or two years. Transmission of HPV really is through intimate skin to skin, so very personal, close contact with an infected person. Um, so usually through vaginal, penile, anal, or oral sex, and that's how you get your mucosal or genital HPV infections. Close personal contact is really how you get most of your cutaneous warts, so like you know, common in children in the, in the adolescent group. Auto-inoculation can occur um, from one body, so one from one body site to another. Um, in in very young children who have um, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, they get it through passage through an infected birth canal. Um, and then really, you know, there's, there's been some, um, you know, some uh, concerns or, or gossip about, oh, you know, can I get it from a toilet seat? That kind of a thing. But really the role of fomites in the transmission of HPV is, is very uncertain. So we don't have really data or evidence to prove that, oh, you can get it from, you know, on, on a toilet seat. Really it's more from very close contact. Um, genital HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States and worldwide. Um, there is really no temporal association or seasonal variation when it comes to HPV infections. Um, and it is something that is communicable or that you can, you know, get in, in uh, that's communicable um, during both acute and persistent infections. Um, and there is a high communicability or transmissibility for HPV because you know, every year there's a large number of new infections that are estimated to occur yearly. Um, but really the risk factor for HPV infection is really primarily driven by sexual behaviors. So um, having multiple um, sexual partners, higher numbers of lifetime and, and recent sex partners. There are other risk factors that have been implicated um, such as younger age and sexual initiation, such some genetic factors, which we can talk about a little bit later. Smoking as well or tobacco use is something that is a risk factor. Um, for HPV infection. Um, there are uh, several clinical manifestations of, um, of HPV infection. So they can range from your warts um, to your papillomatosis to your cervical cancer uh, precursors and, and cancer itself. So we'll start with the more benign ones. So we have the warts. Um, so we have your common warts plain or flat warts, deep plantar warts, and then filiform warts. So your common warts, they're very well demarcated. They're exophytic, hyperkeratotic. They have a rough surface. You can see them um, in the hand, the fingers, around the nails, um, also in the palms or soles, very rarely on mucous membranes, although that can happen. It can also be called verruque vulgaris. Um, and that's the picture there on the very uh, left side of your common wart. The plain or flat warts usually you see in children, they are multiple slightly elevated papules with an irregular contour. Um, they have a smooth surface, um, you know, compared to your common wart. They occur on the face, the neck, and the hands. Um, you also have your deep plantar warts, which you can see mostly in adolescents and young adults. They can be painful. Um, they can also be on the palms of the hands, um, and they look like a raised bundles of soft keratotic fibers, um, and um, shaving will reveal punctate bleeding blood vessels. Um, and then you have your filiform warts, which you can usually see in the hands of butchers, fish handlers, meat packers, and they're, um, you know, on the head are, are vegetating hyperproliferative, but that's what they look like on the very right side. So these are some of the uh, cutaneous warts um, that you can see as a cause of HPV infections. 
Um, for in terms of treatment for of cutaneous warts, really the go-to and the mainstay has been salicylic acid, which is a keratolytic agent. So it's something that a patient, um, you know, can apply by themselves at home. It's fairly um, inexpensive and it's available over the counter. It can take up to 12 weeks to achieve um, a good response. So that's one of the drawbacks for it is that, you know, your patient might think that, oh, it's, I've been putting this on for the last week or a few weeks and it's not working, but you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, consistency and, and patience um, when it comes to, to this form of treatment. But again, this has been the mainstay and um, really has the most evidence um, when it comes to treatment of cutaneous warts as a result, as a result of HPV infection. Um, and then the, the second, um, you know, treatment that can be considered is cryotherapy. Now, it's, it's easy, but it needs, it's something that needs to be done in an office setting and therefore needs, you know, a visit with a healthcare provider. Um, and so that's one of the drawbacks for it too. Um, and, and it may be, um, you know, fairly, um, you know, more expensive, especially in comparison to your salicylic acid. Um, and then there's also pulse dye laser therapy. Um, it uh, has the advantage in that there's fewer treatments, but it's scars and it's, it's painful and it's expensive. Um, and again, requires an in-office visit or a healthcare provider. Um, imiquimod, usually we use more for genital warts, um, but it's um, FDA approved also for cutaneous warts. Um, and it's something that you can use, um, your patient can use at home. Um, it is pregnancy category B. Um, and these are some of the drawbacks for that is that you can have erythema, pruritus, erosion, secondary bacterial infections. And so, um, you know, that's something too that your patient must be counseled on when this is something that you, um, you know, that, that your, you and your patient decide to, to go with in terms of treatment for the ward. Um, there is also um, bleomycin, which is more an intralesional injection. So again, this requires an in-office visit. It's, it's a little bit more costly. Um, but typically only one treatment is needed. There are retinoids that can be used at home. Um, again, pregnancy is a, is a, big, is a big consideration here because it's pregnancy category C and it can be expensive. And then there's intralesional immunotherapy um, which can um, you know, cause some rare influenza-like symptoms. So that's one drawback of that. Um, it can be fairly expensive and it requires um, about three to four um, on average um, treatments in the office. But again, for cutaneous warts, the, the two things that you go to, number one, of course, the salicylic acid, the keratolytic agent, um, and then second would be your cryotherapy. The rest are more, um, the rest of them are more, um, you know, second or third line agents. For um, another clinical manifestation of epidermal plate, uh, of hyper, uh, of HPV infections is epidermal dysplasia verruciformis. Um, so this is one of the, you know, genetic, um, you know, things that can, cause, um, you know, HP or that can make you more prone to, or that, that, that's related to HPV infection. So it's an autosomal recessive genodermatosis. It's linked to a gene loci on chromosome 17 um, and are associated with a large array of um, HPV types. So they usually start out as flat warts. Um, um, and they then cover the torso and then the upper extremity. Um, over the extensor surfaces, these warts may become hypertrophic and very coalescent. Um, in most patients, so if you, if, if you do have, you know, this genodermatosis, usually it will first appear in the first decade of life. Um, beginning in young adulthood, about one third of patients will undergo malignant transformation into invasive squamous cell carcinomas, especially in sun exposed areas. So that's one thing too that you need to, um, you know, be very um, cognizant of. Um, and it does not appear to be contagious to healthy contacts. Um, and then the therapy for this really is 
um, you know, it's it's really careful observation again because there is that association with skin uh, malignancy. Um, any malignant changes should be treated with surgical techniques, either with cold blade or laser cryotherapy or five FU ointments. Um, retinoids in combination with intralesional interferon or calciferol. Calciferol will help with the management of these lesions. Um, and then the other clinical manifestation are your anogenital warts. So they're flesh colored to gray colored hyperkeratotic exophytic papules, either sessile on the skin or attached by a short, broad peduncle. So there are two figures here. The one on the right is more of a, a, a vulvar um, condyloma, condylomata cuminata. Um, and then the one on the bottom is of a, a penile wart. Um, so, you know, these, um, you know, you can see kind of the difference in, in the variation in terms of, you know, one is very sessile, the other one can be pedunculated. Um, and so they can range too from smooth pearly papules to more jagged acuminate growths. Um, and they can you know, vary in size as well, um, you know, very small to very large. Now, usually in females, um, you usually see this more in the posterior um, the vaginal introitus, um, the vulva as well. Um, in males, you can see them in the ureth um, urethral meatus as well, um, more in the shaft. Um, so um, those are the, the common sites of, of these warts. Um, but you also see them in the perianal area. And that's really something that, um, you know, the, the location of that um, involving the perianal area really varies according to sexual practice as well. So, you know, very, um, you know, that, that's very high among those men who have sex with men, so about 10%, um, and then double if they're HIV seropositive, um, lower among heterosexual men. Um, so you have your um, vulvar, um, you know, vaginal, you have your urethral mate, spinile, um, 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 and then you also have your perianal area as sites of your anogenital um, warts. Now, um, three quarters of uh, patients with anogenital warts are asymptomatic, but um, you know um, they can also be have itching, burning, pain, and tenderness um, as a result of them too. Now, exophytic genital warts um, may rarely transform into invasive squamous cell carcinomas, including varicose carcinomas, um, and in um, you know in in some in pregnant people or who are immunosuppressed, they can also reach um, considerable size. Um, genital HPV infections also belong to the spectrum of penal penile, anal, vulvar, vaginal, and cervical intraepithelial neoplasias um, as well. In terms of therapy, so this, this is from the CDC, and, and these are some of uh, you know, the therapies available for anogenital warts. Um, you can classify them as either patient-applied or having to be administered by a provider. For those that are patient-applied, you have your options, which are amiquimod, podophylax, or um, Sinecatechins, um, which is more a, a green tea extract derivative, um, but um, you know you you need to consider that since since sinecatechins um, actually might weaken condoms and vaginal diaphragms, and then for those that are provider administered, um, you have your options of cryotherapy with either liquid nitrogen or cryoprobe or a surgical removal or usage of trichloroacetic acid or bichloroacetic acid. Now the other clinical manifestation, and this one we see usually in young children, is recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. So patients may present with hoarseness because it usually affects your voice box or your larynx. Um, in infants, they can present with an altered cry. Um, now while these are you know, benign, um, they can 
um, you know, present with very um, severe symptoms because they can present with obstructions or respiratory obstruction. They can get secondarily infected. They can cause um, respiratory failure as well. Um, so again, even though fairly benign, the consequences or the implications are, are fair, can be fairly severe. Um, in young children, the rapid growth of lesions often threaten the upper respiratory tract. Um, and that's when they need surgical excision to avoid asphyxiation. Therapy for them is fairly complex, actually. Um, this is more from, um, more from Mandel, but um, the therapy that, um, that they have for, um, for, pap for respiratory papillomatosis really, um, for primary debulking of lesions, it requires some sort of surgical um, um, intervention. They can use a CO2 laser. Um, there are mechanical devices like micro resectors. Uh, photodynamic laser therapy is also there too. But, but really, when it comes to respiratory papillomatosis, you need to take into consideration that, hey, you know, this is uh, the kind of disease that has a, a, a recurrent nature. And so, um, any time that you um, you know, uh, opt to, to do some sort of, um, you know, more invasive intervention. You, you need to have a, a careful balance between the risks and benefits of, of surgery because, again, you know, they can recur. Um, tracheostomy should really be avoided um, in the subset of, of patients who, who have respiratory papillomatosis because um, they could actually extend to the tracheostomy site and then further down the respiratory tree. Um, radiotherapy, um, so for respiratory papillomatosis, there can be a risk of malignant transformation. So that's why radiotherapy is, is contraindicated. Um, you know, in patients who have recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Now, for other kinds of HPV infections, you have your oral squamous papillomas, oral condyloma acuminatum, and oral verruca vulgaris. So for your oral squamous cell papillomas, um, these are the most common HPV-related oral lesions. That's the picture on the very top. Um, so that's your oral squamous cell papilloma. Um, you can also get oral condyloma acuminatum, um, which is a, a closely related entity just with some slight differences in histologic features. That's the middle picture over there. And then oral verruca vulgaris, which is even rarer, um, but can only really be differentiated reliably by histology. So for the diagnosis, you know, we've gone over cutaneous warts and really the diagnosis for those kinds of things are really made clinically or through the physical exam. They do have a very um, a characteristic appearance in, in the first place. But, um, you know, for certain kinds of lesions, you really need to do your just um, you know, due diligence, and, and sometimes you really need to go the route of a biopsy. And so biopsies you need to do for um, lesions of the external genitalia. If they're pigmented, uh, they appear as plaques, they bleed or are large because you want to rule out a malignancy. For epidermal dysplasia verruciformis, you need histopathology really to make that diagnosis. And then for lesions of the oral cavity and upper airways, um, you, know, you, you really want to, um, you know, want to make sure that you rule out malignancy um, in those settings as well. So biopsies in, in these settings um, really um, you know, would be beneficial. For patients with um, you know, anagental warts, so um, you use or you do an anoscopic exam, so does not very look like, you know, that's the figure on your right aid of how you do an anoscopy. Um, it doesn't look very comfortable. Um, you'll really probably have to tuck your patient into it, but it really should be, um, you know, uh, very, you know, something that you should really consider and talk to your patient about, especially if they have perianal warts, anal symptoms, or a history of receptive anal intercourse. So we talked about how earlier, you know, our patients who have, who are um, MSMs or men who have sex with men, um, you know, are at a much higher risk um, of getting 
um, uh, perianal warts compared to say heterosexual men. Um, their risk doubles when they have um, HIV or HRV positive. Um, and so, um, you know, these are the kinds of, or the subset of patients or um, persons that you should be talking to about an anoscopic exam. Now, most intra-anal lesions are below the pectinate line, so you don't really have, um, you know, to um, do a sigmoidoscopy or it's not really indicated most of the time. Um, and if you have a patient with, you um, um, perianal warts or anogenital warts, you also want to make sure that um, you examine their oral cavity um, as well to rule out the possibility of concomitant oral warts. So, you know, again, um, HPV does not only cause, you know, genital cancers, they can also cause or oropharyngeal cancers. Um, so you, you want to make sure that, um, you know, you you do justice to your patient by being thorough. Um, and then um, there is also um, another um, you know, way of diagnosing HPV infections. Um, and this is with a colposcopy. Um, and you look for this reaction called acetoitening. So essentially what you do is, um, so you have a, a colposcope, um, which is on that figure over there. Um, and then for, um, you know, there, there is prior application of um, a 3% to 5% acetic acid solution. And you leave that on uh, like for three to five minutes and you will see um, a reaction called acetoitening, which essentially is, you know, whitening. <laughs> <laughs> of that area you've applied acetic acid to. So it's usually, um, you know, done more for, um, you know, cervical cancer screening. Um, see on this figure over here, you'll see um, that there's this um, you know, irregular, um, irregular, uh, it has irregular borders around the, um, the cervical as, or outside, of, around the cervical as, um, and it's something actually that even though it was originally designed for um, cervical cancer um, um, screening um, or, you know, uh, working up someone, say, with an abnormal um, pap smear or HPV testing or HPV code test, which we'll talk a little bit about later, um, colposcopy actually has been used too for um, um, things like, uh, you know, checking for oropharyngeal cancers to um, that kind of a thing. But, but really, again, the intended was for more, um, you know, cervical um, cancer. Um, acetoitening, though, um, really lacks specificity for the diagnosis of an HPV infection, particularly for external anogenital um, warts. Um, in terms of prevention uh, for HPV infections and then the, you know, the, the genital cancers that can come, um, you know, with it or as a result of it, um, the number one thing has been, you know, cervical cancer screening and making sure that our patients are up to date on these. Now, there are three ways by which we can do cervical cancer screening. Um, you can have your, you know, your gold standard, your cytology, your pap smear, papa Nicholas smear, um, and then you have just HPV testing. So it's more of a PCR test looking into the higher risk HPV types that we've talked about earlier. And then a combination of um, HPV and pap, uh, which is co-testing. So on your right is um, the figure, um, you know, of, of how a pap smear is done. I think most of us here have, have, have done one at least once in our lives. Um, but, um, you know, you take a, a sample, um, you scrape cells from the squamous columnar junction, you examine it under the microscope, and then you look for any sort of dysplasia um, under the microscope. Um, and the screening for cervical cancer, um, it's been updated fairly recently, at least in the last um, maybe two or three years. Um, but this essentially is the gist of, 
or a good summary of that recommendation. And this is more for the general population. So for women um, or those who have uh, a cervix um, age 21 to 29 years, you screen for cervical cancer every three years with cytology or pap smear alone. So you don't really use um, your HPV um, um, you know, PCR or testing or co-test here at this um, um, at this in this age group, um, and then so you start at twenty one, um, and then when from twenty one to twenty nine, um, you do um, cervical cancer uh, screening with cytology alone every three years. Um, for women aged thirty to sixty five. Um, then you can apply either of the three methodologies for cervical cancer screening we've talked about earlier. So um, every three years with cytology alone, or you can do every five years with higher risk HPV testing alone, or every five years with the code test, so your HPV plus pap smear. In patients who are younger than 21 years old, um, women who are older than 65 years old with adequate prior screening and um, at least less than, um, you know, in the last 10 years don't, don't have any um, um, abnormal smears or tests, um, or if they've had a hysterectomy, then you do not need to screen for cervical cancer. Um, but in our HIV um, population, um, you know, that's, that's H cervical cancer screening is, is different. And the reason for that is that really, you know, 75, um, basically our HIV um, positive women are, you know, are more likely to develop cervical cancer. So compared to the general population, they're five times more likely to develop cervical cancer. And when they do, they progress twice as, as quickly, um, you know, compared to, to um, a, a non-HIV um, um, patient. So again, um, you know, in, among individuals with HIV, um, cancer is associated with, again, 16 and 18, 16 and 18 is what you need to, to remember. Just those two types account for 66% of, you know, cervical um, cancers. Um, and then you, you have your other um, um, high risk types as well. Um, Again, the risk of HPV-related cervical disease is, is higher in individuals with HIV. Um, and the reasoning for this is that cervical cancer, um, you know, in, in these patients, you know, happen, um, you know, they're, ha they're more likely to develop this because, you know, again, when you go back to our earlier slides, 90% of most HPV infections will resolve right in the next one in, in one or two years. But in the in a patient with HIV, they're the ones who have um, a persistence of the infection, which is one of your highest risk factors for actually developing a malignancy from 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 HPV. So that's the reasoning why um, you know in this in this in this group you really um, you know they're your risk for for HPV. So given that um, you know the cervical cancer screening in persons with HIV are, are a little bit different. Um, for those who are 21 to 29 years or less than 30 years, um, instead of, uh, you know, you can start at 21 years or um, when they um, are initially diagnosed of HIV, with HIV. So if, um, you know, if they're 21 years, you, you start screening them or earlier if, if they've been diagnosed with HIV earlier. That's one of the differences in terms of screening compared to the general population. Um, and then you have your, um, you know, your pap test should still be done at baseline in every 12 months. Um, and if the results of three consecutive pap tests are normal, then pap test or cytology can be performed every three years. Um, code testing um, it really is not recommended for women younger than 30 years, HIV positive or not. Um, once you reach 30 years, um, so in the 30 years to uh, 30 years to 65 um, age group, um, really with um, patients who have HIV or uh, women who have HIV, you you don't do um, so. Earlier we had these three 
um, you know, recommend or methodologies by which you could screen. You could do um, just the BAP test only or cytology only. You can do the co-test or you can do just the high-risk HPV um, PCR or um, testing. Um, but really in the HIV age group, you don't, um, you know, it's not really recommended yet to do the high-risk HPV testing yet. You're really just um, going to do either cytology or the co-test. Um, so if you're going to go the route of, um, you know, cyto of, of cytology only or BAP testing only, um, then you should do it at baseline every 12 months. And then again, if the results of three consecutive PAP tests are normal, then you can just do it every three years. If you go the route of um, HPV co-testing, um, you know, this is another, um, um, you know, part of the screening, which is a little bit different. So in the normal, you know, in the non-HIV group, if the PAP or the code test or the PAP plus HPV co-testing is negative, then you do it every five years. But, but here um, in, in people with HIV, you do it every three years. Um, and then these are some of the, the things below here that, um, that they do if, if the um, PAP test is normal, but HPV co-testing is positive. So either you a follow-up test with a PAP test and HPV co-testing in one year, um, if the one year follow up is a normal or HPV co testing is still positive, then you refer for a colposcopy. Um, or you um, perform HPV genotyping. Um, and if they're positive for 16 or 18, then you do colposcopy. If negative for 16 and 18, then you repeat a co test in one year, and so on and so forth. Um, so cervical cancer screening in persons with HIV again is a little is is different in terms of in those who don't have HIV in that. So you know earlier we talked about how if you're um, 65 years or older and you've had um, you know you you can stop essentially um, um, getting your screens. Um, cervical cancer screening at the age of 65, especially if you know only if you have had a, a normal pap smear, um, no abnormal pap smears in the last 10 years. But in those with HPV, you continue to screen in this population beyond the age of 65 years. Um, and so that's the, the recommendation by the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. Um, however, um, you know, we must take into consideration um, you know, shared decision making. Um, you know, it's something that's, that's really very important to in, in our patients who have, um, you know, who have HIV is that, you know, there are other things, um, you know, that you can take into consideration, especially if a, if a patient, um, you know, um, is, isn't wanting, you know, or, or isn't wanting to get their, their, their cervical cancer screening any more, but really what you, you look into are the, um, you know, of course, you assess the risks and benefits, um, possible mitigating factors involved with ongoing risk for HPV infection purpose of screening. So, you know, you look at their, vir if they're virologically suppressed, um, you look at their risk factors for HPV, um, you know, risk of acquisition, um, their prior screening results, their risk of cervical cancer, all of those things, um, life expectancy. So even though it's really recommended um, to continue screening in this population beyond 65 years, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's exceptions to that, but that should be, um, you know, a, a shared decision made by, um, you know, both the, the, the patient and the physician taking into consideration a lot of very, um, you know, patient-specific um, risk factors. Um, and then um, the, you know, very important too, um, aside from cervical cancer screening in terms of prevention is, you know, the, the HPV vaccines. Now, they're Cervix was the or the bivalent HPV vaccine. It was um, you know the, the brand name for it was Cervix. I think it came out in the in the early to mid two thousands, um, and it really only covered HPV type sixteen and eighteen, um, and it was really only for females nine to twenty five years because these are the ones that cause cervical cancer. 
Um, and then, um, you know, but now, you know, with, with um, uh, Gardasil 9, which is the nine valent HPV vaccine server, which the bivalent vaccine really isn't available anymore and was taken off the market in the US. Um, there's a, two kinds of Gardasil. One is the quadrivalent, the other one is the nine valent. Um, the quadrivalent um, covers your six and 11, which cause your genital warts, and then 16 and 18. Um, that's something that's recommended for males and females, nine to 26. But um, you know the, the standard now is the Gardasil 9, which also covers the additional five um, other higher risk serotypes of, uh, or types of HPV, um, your 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. And again, that's for males and females aged 9 to 26. For vaccine characteristics, characteristics really, it's the, ant the antigen that's used for the vaccine. It's the HPV L1 major capsid protein that's used. Um, it's produced using recombinant technology. Um, the L1 protein self-assemble into virus-like particles. They're non-infectious, they're non-oncogenic, they're administered intramuscularly, um, and they contain yeast protein and aluminum adjuvant, but there's no thiamersal here. Um, you know, thiamersal has been kind of perpetuated in, in the media as, as, as causing autism, that kind of thing. Um, not that, that there's really any truth to it, um, but you know, just if you know, HPV vaccine doesn't contain that anyway, and I don't think it's been used in a lot of vaccines since 2001. Um, so don't be, you know, um, don't believe sometimes what you see, um, especially, especially among, um, you know, uh, groups that are vaccine hesitant. Um, about autism, that kind of a thing, thiamersal, um, your HPV vaccine doesn't have that. Um, so the HPV vaccination schedule, so so really the, the thing that we want is to give them the vaccine before they're even exposed to, um, you know, the HPV, you know, the HPV virus. Um, so really you want to catch them um, before they're sexually active. So the, that's why the routine vaccination is recommended for females and males at at least age 11 or 12 years, at minimum age nine years. Um, if you have a patient who, um, you know, needs, who's up to 26 years old, and um, then you can consider catch-up vaccination for them if they're not adequately vaccinated. But once they're over 26 years old, so 27 through 45 years, um, so basically, essentially, um, if they're over 26, um, it's not that you can't give them the vaccine, but that these you need some, you know, you need to again do some shared clinical decision making, um, depending on how you know higher risk or low risk your patient is and if they'll have benefit even with the um, with the vaccine because for the vaccine trials they really use that age group of 9 to 26 um, and this one you know it's, it's really just the vaccine itself is not licensed for adults over um, the age of 45 um, so again um, you know, HPV vaccination, you start, um, usually it's 11 or 12 years of age, um, but beginning at nine years of age, you know, you can start giving the HPV vaccine. Um, and then um, ideally, you know, vaccine should be administered before any exposure to HPV through sexual contact. Um, vaccination will provide less benefit to those sexually active Persons who have already been infected with one or more HPV vaccine types, uh, but but really you can um, you know still provide protection against the HPV vaccine types that that the, that patient has not already acquired. Now, in terms of shared clinical decision making, you know when you talk to, or when we talk to our patients about these, there the the things that you want to highlight in this discussion of shared clinical decision making and in terms of you know giving um, the HPV vaccine in adults 27 to 45 you want to look at their you know their 
their their risk of, of getting HPV infection. So, um, you know, again, although new HPV infections are most commonly acquired adolescents and young adulthood when you're most sexually active, um, at any age, having a new sexual partner is a risk for acquiring a new HPV infection. So, so you know, if you have a patient who is considering um, you know, getting a, the HPV vaccine, but they're over the age of 26 or they're through, they're in that 27 to 45 year age group. You know, if they're in a long-term mutually monogamous sexual relationship, then, you know, they're not likely to get a new HPV infection anyway. So maybe, you know, that's, that's something that might weigh heavily on, on their decision to, to whether or not get the vaccine. Um, and again, HPV vaccine efficacy is high among persons who have not been exposed to vaccine type, um, uh, who, have, who have not been exposed to vaccine type HPV vaccination. So the HPV vaccination schedule, there's a two dose series and a three dose series. Um, the two dose series we follow for immunocompetent persons who receive their first uh, valid dose before their 15th birthday. So you can, um, the two dose series is given at, so at, day, at month zero and then the next one from six to 12 months. But, um, you know, there's a minimum interval of at least five months between doses. For the three dose series, you give if they receive their first valid dose on or after their 15th birthday. Um, and um, you can also consider that for persons with primary or secondary immunocompromising conditions and you follow this zero, um, one to two, six month schedule. Um, if the series um, is interrupted, you don't need to restart the series. Um, Pre-vaccination assessments like virginity assessments, those kinds of things or, um, uh, you know, are not really recommended um, for you to get the vaccine. Um, and again, you know, vaccines are more uh, prophylactic, so your patients need to, to know about that too. Um, they have no therapeutic effect on if they already have an existing HPV infection, anogenital wart, or HPV-related lesion. Um, vaccine safety. So the, the studies for the, the vaccine, you know, really showed that it was very well tolerated. You can get side effects from the vaccine, but the side effects really are more um, the common kinds of reactions you get with a vaccine in the first place, like, you know, local injection site reactions, pain, redness, swelling. You can, you can get a fever. Anaphylaxis is rare but can occur, um, but there were really no other serious adverse reactions associated with the HPV vaccine. Not to say that there are no contraindications and precautions that you should practice or that you should um, you know, practice when, when, you're, um, when you have a patient who's getting the vaccine. So you know, they're contraindicated, of course, if they have a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or a component of the vaccine, if there's a history of immediate hypersensitivity reaction to yeast because they use Saccharomyces, um, I think it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, for this, or if there's an allergy to that, that's a contraindication. If there's an anaphylactic um, allergy to latex, but that only counts for the Cerberix, which is off market anyway. And then some precautions, you know, are, you know, if they have a patient who has a moderate or severe acute illness, then you may want to wait or uh, until they improve before you give the vaccine. Um, and then really HPV vaccination um, during pregnancy is not really uh, recommended. Um, if you have a patient who had already um, you know, started her vaccine series um, and then got, got pregnant, then you, you, you delay essentially the series until after, after they complete the pregnancy. They can get the vaccine after, you know, after they're, they've delivered. So even when they're um, breastfeeding, they can get the vaccine. Um, but really, if a woman is found, um, you know, uh, pregnant um, after getting the vaccine, um, there's really no specific intervention that's needed. You just need to report it to the manufacturer, perhaps, so they can, you know, follow the patient after that. Um, but again, you know, pregnancy testing tool is not needed before vaccination. The vaccine is very effective. Um, more than 98% of recipients develop an antibody response um, within one month after completing the series. Um, there's 
really no evidence of efficacy against disease caused by vaccine types with which participants were infected at the time of the vaccination. Um, and then again, you know, prior infection with one HPV type does not diminish the efficacy of the vaccine against the other vaccine HPV types. Um, and so, you know, in, in based off of CDC's website in 2020, um, the HPV vaccination coverage among adolescents 75.1%, and that was, you know, that 75.1% at least had one um, or, or more doses, and 58.6% were HPV up to date. Um, you know, comparing that, say, to your Tdap vaccination rates, which are upwards of 90%, it looks like we still have a long ways to go, at least here in the United States, in terms of improving. Um, you know, our, our HPV vaccination rates. But, you know, in the last um, just 10 years after the vaccine was recommended in 2006, you know, even with not paltry, but, you know, could use some improvement kind of rates, vaccination rates, the quadrivalent type HPV infections decreased by 86% in female teens 14 to 19 years and 71% in women in their early 20s. So that just goes to show you how, you know, even with, um, you know, well, relatively lower vaccination rates for HPV that we're still making a lot of headway, um, you know, against, um, you know, in preventing HPV infections. Um, and so, you know, the, the higher, the better that we do with our vaccination rates, you know, the more benefit we can only reap from that. And um, this is my, my last slide, basically, from, again, the CDC, um, you know, HPV vaccination works, um, decreases um, infections with HPV types um, that cause most HPV cancers and genital warts by 71% among teen girls. Um, and it can prevent cancer. Um, more than 29,000 29, cases of cancers each year could be prevented with HPV vaccination. And that's the same as the average attendance for a baseball game. So that's huge. Um, and that's each year. So um, I know really vaccines work um, and so, you know, we should, um, you know, it's been recommended since 2006 now um, as healthcare providers, as doctors, um, you know, we should, um, you know, really, um, um, you know, we should really advocate, um, you know, for vaccination, um, you know, in, in, our, in our adolescents and young adults. Um, and so these are my, you know, the, the, the gist of, not the gist, but most of my references. Um, and then thank you so much for your time. I'm open to any questions if you guys have any. Thank you so much, Dr. I, I agree. I think their patient population for HP is such a large, like so many people are affected. So this is definitely a very interesting topic. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, Dr. Chinda or anyone in Cameroon, you can unmute or you can put uh, any questions in the chat? Mary, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Well, we actually don't have any questions. We're just really thankful to you for the excellent talk and all you shared. And we just can't wait to go through all those recommendations for screening again. So I know Help for the World usually uploads the video after 48 hours. So I personally just can't wait to go through all those recommendations for screening and for vaccination. So, but really, thank you really for the excellent talk. I, I see a, a question um, from um, um, Ernesto um, Espinoza. So the question was, after the treatment of condylomatous lesions, the application of the vaccine 
prevents the recurrence. So um, again, you know, the vaccine is more prophylaxis. If you're already infected with the, um, um, so again, there's many different kinds of, of, of um, types of um, the HPV type that can cause um, ASA in the genital wart. If it's something that the can't know exactly, you know, from norm from normal practice, we can't really know what HPV type say caused that patient's um, condylomatous lesion. If it was something that the patient essentially had already been exposed to before, had persistent infection, and that's the reason why they had the condylomatous lesion, um, then um, you know if if it's it can it can prevent against that one type, for example, but it can prevent um, you know, and so you can still technically have recurrence, um, but you can prevent um, you know other types of HPV that's in the vaccine that cause um, condylomatous lesions do. So it would be specific to the kind, I guess the, the answer would be it be specific to the type of, of HPV that caused the condylomatous lesion. In this scenario, I don't think that it would prevent the recurrence on account of your patient already had persistent infection, a condylomatous lesion as a result of that. Um, and, and, you know, you can have recurrence to, which is the nature of this disease, but you can prevent getting uh, a condylomatous lesion if, if it was from a different kind of HPV type. Um, any other questions? There is another question in the Q and A. Is there any screening necessary for men as well, and are there any such guidelines? So for for men, um, so there is screening for that's recommended for essentially for especially for high risk men um, who are say men with sexual uh, men who have sex with men. Um, you know, if they have perianal warts and they have, um, you know, they're at risk for anal cancers, of course. So that's why you go with, um, you know, an anoscopy in those scenarios. Um, you know, if you have a patient with, um, especially if they're HIV positive, they have perianal warts, they have high risk sexual behavior, such as being an MSM. Um, you know, you, you do screen for them, but um, there's no, not that I know, um, a, a schedule uh, or like a, a strict guideline that we follow. But, but again, you know, as a provider, if you have, if you encounter a patient like that, that you think is higher risk for anal cancer by virtue of those risk factors and that they have, you know, very anal warts, then, then you do um, anoscopy and, and screening for um, anal cancer. But there's nothing quite like that set in stone, um, kind of like, um, you know, the one we have for cervical cancer. Perfect. I think those are all the questions that I see. So with that, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Chua, for your time. This was very informative and really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and speak to us about this. And thank you, Cameroon and everyone else for joining. Uh, we'll see you at the next Ground Rounds in, next month. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pranati. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.